Well, turn your Bibles with me to Luke 23. We started Jesus' sham trial last week as Jesus was arrested and pulled before the high priest and in the cover of night was beaten um, as they were asking him, prophesy who hit you, prophesy who hit you. And ironically, this was juxtaposed to the fact that Jesus knew that Peter was going to betray him. Um, He did, in fact, betray him. And that moment that Peter betrayed him, Jesus looked over and saw Peter, and Peter wept bitterly for having sort of been caught in the act and for falling into the trap that Jesus knew knew was coming. Today, we're looking at the synagogue as they're trying to make appeals to Pilate and Herod and then Pilate again, finally standing before the audience of the people to finally convict Jesus. Uh, We're going a little further than what's in your bulletins. We're going to go all the way up to verse 25, um, just because as I was studying it, it really felt like that was its natural stopping point. But for us, as we're looking at this, we're going to see just how much of this trial reflects our own problems with Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from our redemptive, the redemptive work that Christ has done in us to believe in Him, the human heart, left to our own devices, hates Christ and will use Him, and ultimately did abuse Him and put Him to death because our motives are so apart, so different from His. 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 22 through 24 says this, For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We're going to see this play out very clearly today. The Greeks search for wisdom. Pilate is looking into Jesus from a a standpoint of, of virtue and justice and Herod is going to go looking for signs, and the people ultimately will cry, crucify him, crucify him. This was the message of the gospel lived out before the people as they experienced it, that Christ would stand before them, a guiltless man, suffer for them, and do nothing to prevent it. He would, like a lamb before its shears is silent, be silent before those who would accuse him. He accepted what was coming. He had in his life invited what was coming, and now he was obeying the Father even to the point of death Um, with every painful blow, every insult, every accusation. He accepted the shame and the guilt that was due for you and me for himself. Let's go ahead and start reading in verse uh, 1 of, of chapter 23. It says, The whole body of them, this is the synagogue, got up and brought him before Pilate, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding him to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you king of the Jews? And he answered him, saying, It is as you say. Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching over all over Judea and starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. And when Pilate heard it, he uh, asked whether the man was a Galilean. And he learned that, it was, that he belonged to Herod's jur- jurisdiction. And he sent him to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at the time. Look at the accusation laid before Jesus. In verse, um, tw- in verse 2, it says, We found this man misleading our nation, forbidding, the pe- uh, uh, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ the King. The first accusation is, is vague, if not just subjective. Well, he's misleading our nation. Well, I mean, I, I mean that's just a, a really broad and sort of empty threat, uh, especially to Rome, a Roman official. You know, it's like, well, what's, what's the substance of this? You don't like the guy, sort of don't care. Um, well, the second is false, right? He, he, he was accused of um, preventing people from paying taxes, Uh, This is just not true, right? Jesus uh, is known, a known associate of tax collectors. And just in chapter 20, uh, he had said, you better pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what is God's. So that part's false, and Caesar probably knows it. He probably has heard enough of this man's teaching. Um, Jesus has been around, you know, in Jerusalem, sort of occupying the temple courts and and preaching on a, a daily basis. At some level, Jesus is a known factor to Pilate, even though Pilate's probably less than interested. Um, 
the, fast, the, 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 the last accusation is true, saying that he is Christ, a king. And Pilate, wise as he is, at least in this moment, um, just this moment, <laughs> uh, understands that that is the, the true accusation that these men are leveling. That's what's really got them upset. So Pilate focuses in on the true issue. And he asks them, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, it is as you say. Jesus has been occupying uh, the temple of Jerusalem for several days. There's been no issues. And he rode in on a donkey. I mean, how threatening can he be, right? In Pilate's mind, he's not seeing a man here that's posing a credible threat to Rome. Jesus, like I said, is a known associate of tax collectors, and he's done nothing to subvert their income. Um, he advocated that people pay their taxes and, and did so inside the home court of Jerusalem. The only credible accusation to Jesus here is his kingship. But Pilate sees no militant Messiah. Jesus has come peacefully. He's likely showing visible signs of the beating that he's received from uh, the men at the, uh, at the high priest's house. So he's, he's already looking uh, a diminished, downtrodden, um, you know, he's coming in a wounded man and he's not putting up much of a fight. Jesus is just sort of returning Pilate's question to himself. You think I'm king of the Jews? It's as you say, right? There has to be some level of sarcasm in, in Pilate's voice here. Are you king of the Jews? Because I really think as we're going to see that through, through this passage, how much Pilate and Herod um, have in common in their hate for the people that they rule. Are you king of the Jews? Look at this man beaten, small, quiet, silent before me. Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus, he might hear the sar sarcasm, but the truth is the truth. He says, it's as you say, I am king of the Jews. Jesus, just previously in the Sanhedrin, had been accused of being called the son of God, the one who will be seated at the right hand of Yahweh. And they ask, are you, are you that man? He says, yes, I am. So here it is, that accusation. Jesus is not standing up with some kind of a defense because that part of the charge is true. That represents his motive properly. King of the Jews properly reflects Jesus's motive. And that motive in Pilate's eyes is not unlawful. It's not immoral. And he says for the first time, the first of three that you'll see, I see no guilt in this man. Pilate has examined the case and sees no guilt. So when we talk about Jesus living a sinless life and being brought before a, you know, a bit of a kangaroo court here. It's actually the opinion of the ruling authority here that Jesus himself is innocent, has done nothing wrong. He's done nothing to earn the cross that he's about to be condemned to. But Jesus here, in Pilate's mind, poses no credible threat to Rome, so he passes the buck. Anytime I sort of pass on some work at, at my job, it's because it's somebody else's problem. I'm actually not interested. Hey, this thing has come up. Oh, go talk to so-and-so about it, because I don't care. That's exactly what's going on here. Pilate hears that this man's from Galilee and he says, oh, this is, this is Herod's problem. Go send him to Herod because I don't like that guy. Let's make it his problem. So the crowd and, and, and the, uh, the synagogue now goes before Herod in verse 8. Let's go to verse 8. It says, now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. And he questioned him at some length. And he answered him, nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there, accusing him vehemently. And Herod, with his soldiers, uh, sorry, and Herod, uh, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. The synagogue is now appealing to Herod, and they've gone to, I guess, their local jurisdictional authority. This was a long-awaited meeting, at least on the part of Herod. He'd been wanting to see him for a long time. Now, you can remember there's some family histories between these two, even though they've never met. Herod the Great, this was um, uh, a man that was the king when Jesus was born, had made a point of trying to hunt down and kill the Messiah. This is now Herod Antipas, his son who was responsible for killing John the Baptist. John the Baptist had accused, well, not even accused, he had openly criticized uh, Herod's marriage with his sister-in-law. Um, 
and for it, John the Baptist was murdered. Now, this was Jesus' cousin. This was a close family tie. And previously in Luke, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus actually gives a bit of political commentary. Veiled though it may be, it's political commentary. In Luke 13, 31, he says, at, uh, at that time, some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Jesus replied, go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. So the Pharisees, wanting to scuttle Jesus' mission, said, go somewhere else, you're in danger here. And Jesus' answer is, well, that fox, I'm not afraid of him. I'll keep on doing my miracles, I'll keep out driving out demons, and guess what? I'm setting my face towards Jerusalem, I'm making a point of going there, because I understand that death awaits me, that's why I'm going. So Herod, he was told off. I mean, for having killed his cousin, Jesus was pretty merciful there, calling him only a fox. Certainly a criticism, um, but definitely dismissive. Jesus is dismissive of Herod's power here. So Herod had long awaited this moment. Herod had been anticipating meeting him, and he was ready for some parlor tricks. He was ready for Jesus to just do something cool, do a cute little magic trick, Jesus. Let's see it. Jesus would not reveal himself to the hard-hearted man of Herod. Herod wouldn't get Pharaoh's treatment. Pharaoh got signs and wonders. And that's exactly what Herod's hoping for. Give me a sign. Show me something wonderful. And so he questions him. And you can imagine these are condescending sort of leading questions. And Jesus answers him nothing. He's just stone cold silent. He will not give Herod the time of day here. Herod didn't get Pharaoh's treatment with the signs and wonders. But he got one better. In terms of testimony, what did he get? He got Jesus himself. He got to see Christ the King in the flesh. He got to see this moment. It was a witness. It was a testimony to him. The Greeks desired wisdom. The Jews seek for signs, but we preach Christ crucified. Christ crucified is enough for believers. Signs and wonders, miracles, as we would call them, or uh, wisdom, looking for apologetics and, and for philosophy and for uh, great one-liners of logic. We are all wanting these things, but what is it that saves the human heart? It's Christ himself seeing the man and knowing him personally. This is what Herod had, and it did, it did him no good. Jesus would not answer him because he knew that he would not believe. Just earlier in the previous chapter, Jesus refuses to answer to the synagogue. He says, if I tell you, you will not believe. They're asking if he's the Christ. He says, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you a question, you will not answer. Jesus knows the hard-hearted. And in this case, he refuses to share the message and to try to dialogue with him because Jesus knows his heart. Jesus knows nothing's going to change. He was revealed to, I mean, the Son of God himself. And there he is, taunting, berating, and abusing Jesus. It was out of the overflow of Herod's heart. Isaiah 53 points this out about Jesus' lack of response says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Herod places a purple robe on Jesus. It's, it's said to be gorgeous. Now, purple was obscenely expensive. There was royalty that couldn't afford purple, and yet this is a whole robe worth. It's, uh, it's just lavish. I mean, it would be like putting your prisoner in a Lamborghini to like take him down the street to draw much, as much attention and shame to this person as you could. It's an ironic and sick joke. Jesus was adorned as a king. His shame and condemnation is actually precisely what made him king of the Jews. It's through suffering that Jesus would win the Davidic throne. What was meant to taunt him was actually true of him. Jesus dressed like a king. Well, he was the king. And it was through this shame and condemnation and suffering that was making him king, that would allow him to earn the throne and ascend to the right hand of the Father. He was worthy of that robe that was used to shame him. Herod gets his entertainment, but no satisfaction with the signs and the wonders. But his gain is political. We know from this passage in that very last verse there in verse, um, in verse 12, now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day and before they had been enemies with each other. This mockery of Jesus 
making a carnival show out of Jesus' suffering and his claims to the Davidic throne, Curry's favor with Pilate. It actually unites these two men in what I've called the unholy alliance to, uh, based on our uh, title today. Herod gets his inter entertainment, or doesn't get his entertainment, but he gets political favor with Pilate. And I want to look at this alliance that they've forged here for our benefit, just to sort of put a picture into the political intrigue of what's going on with Jesus' crucifixion. Herod and Pilate were once enemies and are now friends. This is just a, a shameful thing, but, th but they're making a joke out of Jesus and his suffering and his claims. And Herod sends him back to Pilate and says, you know, it turns out I see no problem with this man. This is back in your court. Pilate, what are you going to do? The shameful treatment comes as an inside joke between these two political powers. What did these two have in common that brought them together? Both are puppet leaders of the Roman government, extensions of Roman oppression. And I think both hated the religious leadership. Their cooperation with the synagogue was cynical. It was, it was pragmatic at best. Herod was no God-fearing Jew. Remember, he took his brother's wife. And Pilate had made a point of desecrating the temple mixing the blood of Galileans with their temple sacrifices. You can see that in Luke 13, verse 1 through 5. Herod the Great had built the temple to buy off the Jews and support him as the puppet king. And Rome had funded the project and worked to install the Sadducees there who were sympathetic to Herod. They were a regime-friendly religion. They sort of had the trappings of, oh, we're anti-Rome, and oh, we're going to see a, a great, uh, we're going we're to create a great uprising. But they, they had Rome's thumb on them, and they were paid off. It was, it was sort of a, a neutered um, rebellion. These guys were not going to be the threat to Rome. Rome was known for attempting to display a Roman eagle on top of uh, the temple at one point. So all of this was just trying to placate the religious elite. So on the one side, you have the political leaders and Herod and Pilate. And on the other side, the people that are bringing forward the accusation is the, the religious elite. It's that priestly class. The political leadership was united in hating the religious leadership of Jerusalem. Their treatment of Jesus was sarcastic. It was uh, invalidating the concerns of the synagogue. Look, look at your little king. Are you afraid of this man? We're going to dress him up in robes and beat him. Are you still afraid of this man? Can we just abuse him and, and, and calm you down and send him out to live in the streets and, and you guys can just calm, calm down and go home? Jesus bears the shame in derision that the political leadership had for the religious leadership in his own flesh. As a matter of their hatred for the other side, Jesus actually incurs the abuse. The priestly class is happy to see this belittle, uh, their, their concerns belittled because with every passing uh, put down to their concerns, it's Jesus who is harmed instead of them. Because the political leadership hated these priests Jesus is taunt taunted and beaten to make light of their concerns, and they don't mind because at least the guy they hate is getting abused. Rome and Herod had a common concern, controlling people. They wanted control. Rome needed Herod to be king of the Jews, in quotations, and Herod maintained power by placating and enabling this corrupt, regime-friendly religion of the Sadducees and the scribes that made up the synagogue that day. If the synagogue is worried about Jesus being an insurrectionist, then in Pilate and Herod's mind, there's no real threat. Because what's the real threat would be the thing that would get these guys excited. If the Sadducees and the scribes are excited about an insurrectionist, then there's a real threat. But if they don't like the insurrectionist, then these guys have sway with the people. If they're concerned, Jesus is actually probably, in their mind, a useful idiot. Just keeping the people busy. Just keeping the, this class of you know, priestly losers busy. These people were using each other, and Jesus was the pawn. Herod and Pilate, Pilate can relate on their contempt for the people they rule, and their bond over the disdain for the religious elite. But Jesus is the butt of the joke, a token of their derision for the synagogue. Jesus is already suffering on behalf of those who hate him. It's already beginning. He's already suffering for them. Now there's a second appeal to Pilate. In verse 13, Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the, and the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people 
uh, to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. Nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Behold, nothing deserves death. Um, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. So this already shows that Pilate has now made his second, his second uh, point of saying Jesus is not guilty. And the second of three, where Pilate, this objective third party, says there is no guilt in this man. This third uh, guilty, or sorry, innocent plea from, from Pilate is, he's, he's bargaining with these people. He says, look, let's just punish him and let's send him on his way. Why do you lust for blood like you do? The primary difference in the second hearing, though, notice at that very first verse, Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people. Now, there was a bit of a crowd before, but now what's the difference is the audience, the presence of the people. Herod and Pilate have formed an unholy alliance based off a common hatred for the priestly class. So how would the priestly class win over Pilate? How would they get their way? Both the priestly class and the political class had a common fear of the people. They needed control. Everybody needed control of the people. The priests need the people. Their credibility is undermined by Jesus on a daily basis. They need total buy-in from the population to remain in power. They fear the people because the people have turned toward Jesus. He openly mocks them for their godlessness and their sin. And he's taken uh, over their headquarters, the temple courts, and turned it against them in the holiest week of the year for, for uh, Jewish people. So people that have come in for the Passover from far and wide are witnessing Jesus. And they watched him as he flipped over the tables at the temple courts and he occupied the temple courts for days teaching and teaching authoritatively. So the whole watching Jewish world has watched these men be discredited by Jesus himself. So the priestly class had everything to lose if Jesus was the Messiah. They would be completely irrelevant if they weren't certainly hoping for the Messiah himself and just simply wanted to make peace and maintain the status quo. So the priestly class we see here is instrumental in, in convicting Jesus. At the first hearing with Pilate, they say, this man's misleading us. Pilate says, I see no guilt in him. And they come back vehemently accusing him of things. Same thing with Herod. They say to Herod, look, this man is misleading us. Herod says, I see no guilt in him. And again, they come back and say, but wait, no, you don't understand just how awful he's been. And, and, and so the priests here are just, they're lathering it on. They're not accepting these verdicts. And now again, at the second hearing of Pilate, they've made an accusation. Pilate says, I see no guilt, and they're going to lay it on again. They refuse and refuse and refuse to hear that Jesus is innocent before them. Let's continue reading in verse 17. Now, he was obligated to release to them, uh, obligated to release uh, to them at the feast one prisoner. Verse 18, but they cried out all together, saying, away with this man, release to us Barabbas, for he is one who has been thrown into prison for an insurrection uh, made in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But, I, but they kept on calling out, crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them a third time, a third time, why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices, asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced the sentence that demand, their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, and he delivered Jesus to their will. The priests accuse Jesus and are rebuffed, and they double down again three separate times. These men are not consumed with due process, no less justice, and certainly not truth. The priestly class uses um, the political class to discredit Jesus long before the crowds arrived. By the time the people are on the scene, Jesus has undergone multiple rounds of beatings, interrogations, public campaigns of humiliation, and through the night and the long morning and now into the afternoon, the people are here and the priests have succeeded in making Jesus appear guilty, weak, and humiliated. This was an act of character destruction through optics because they could never actually destroy Jesus' character. 
through substance, through dialogue. They could never discredit him before the people in the temple courts with their questions and their, and their gotcha kind of answers. But here they are, they've succeeded in using the political class to just make Jesus look humiliated. And the people are standing, looking at Jesus, and what's the turning point? The turning point of this trial, given these two groups hate each other so much, what they have in common is a fear of the people. And the people have been led to believe that now Jesus is not the Messiah. He's been discredited. He's, he's humiliated. He's weak. He's under the, throne, the thumb of Ro- Rome. Pilate insists for a third time that Jesus is innocent. And given how close it is, I think this parallels Peter, Peter's threefold denial. Three times Peter denied, and three times here, completing the moment, Pilate has said, Jesus is innocent. There's no reason to kill this man. So the turning point in this trial, well, Pilate sought wisdom. He wanted virtue. He wanted justice. Herod, he demanded a sign. He wanted miracles and saw nothing. But the people cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Ultimately, it's what the people demanded. That's what turned this, uh, this trial into, you know, one of a death sentence rather than simply a punishment. Ultimately, it was the people who demanded Jesus' death. We're comfortable blaming our greatest failures on the monolithic oppressors of the political class and the corruption and the selfishness that we can see in religious leadership of the day, but the ultimate failure of mankind before God finds its source directly in our human heart. Each of our human hearts desires evil. We reject Christ as a matter of our as a matter of our, our fleshly, sinful existence, as a matter of our nature, the people's voices begin to prevail. It says that in verse 23, but they were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified and their voices began to prevail. It was the fear of the people that drove the political class and the religious class to agree on killing Jesus. Now, it's what the religious class wanted the whole time, but it's the people's desire. They started making the political powers nervous. They started making the people obsessed with control nervous. And so it's the people's desires that wanted Jesus dead. But ultimately, we might look at excuses for ourselves and say, well, this political power, it's corrupt and it's, it's got its thumb on the people and if they would just stop creating systems that would oppress us, we would be better men and women. We can look at failed religious institutions and leaders and say, well, they've misled the crowds and if If they wouldn't be here, well, perhaps the church would be a purer place. But ultimately, ultimately the buck stops with us. It's our nature that desires a man like Jesus, perfect, truly God and truly man, to die because we hate his goodness. Nobody desires God. Nobody does righteousness. We love our slavery. We insist on our ultimate allegiance to our captors because we own our sin. We love it. It's who we are. The religious class was threatened by Jesus. They hated his leadership, so they falsely convicted Christ. The political class spurned the religious class, so they shamed Jesus to placate the religious leaders. But the people hated the authority figures over them, and in Christ they saw an opportunity to witness the death of a king, and so they called for his torturous execution. The crowd has seen Jesus brutalized and his character disparaged and his power is subverted by the capture and imprisonment. And they have one last chance to stick it to their oppressors. These religious and ruling elites, they call for the release of a murderer and an insurrectionist in Barabbas. Jesus was not seen as a credible threat to Caesar. He was not seen as a credible threat to Herod. So the people want to give him a credible threat. You want to release somebody to us? Give us back the man that you've already imprisoned for insurrection. That's our kind of Messiah. Barabbas represents the people's preference for a Messiah, everything that Jesus wasn't, militant and guilty. The people preferred a murderer to Christ. This was their way of getting back at the ruling class. Release the credible threat. Turn over Jesus to the condemnation of that murderer in his place. You can see there's many different points of intersection between human sinfulness, given your position, whether you're at the top of the heap or at the bottom of the heap, 
Everybody's sinfulness, regardless of your circumstance, wants Jesus dead. So what are our points of application? Jesus is exploited by this unholy alliance as they make their digs at one another. But ultimately, Jesus' death is substitutionary atonement. He suffered in the place of the synagogue at the hands of the political establishment. He suffered at the hands of the people in the place of Barabbas. That murderer's death was then, I guess Jesus' pardon, Jesus' guiltlessness was given to Barabbas and Jesus died where Barabbas should have. Jesus' death was substitutionary atonement. That means that he received the death penalty and the suffering and the wrath of God that was due for you and me. So Jesus took our place. He took our place and suffered so that you and I wouldn't have to. He took his place and suffered for the people there who were actively discrediting him, beating him, and seeking to murder him. He suffered in their place even as this unfolded. The ultimate death sentence did not come from the oppressive political class or out of the the out-of-touch religious elites. Jesus died because the will of the people prevailed. So the point of application for us is that Jesus' death resulted from the outcry of the sinful human heart. Uh, It was um, the director of of The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson. He was asked a, a a pointed question at one interview, and he was asked, did the Jews murder Jesus? you know, trying to make this man sound anti-Semitic. Did the Jews murder Jesus? And he answered back without hesitation and said, no, you and I murdered Jesus. It was you and I who murdered him. We own that guilt for the suffering of a perfect man. We condemned him because we're the ones that sinned. We're the ones that put him up there. And if we were in that crowd, we would have probably been shouting, crucify, crucify. The final point of application here is that although there's much political intrigue and much to be said about the human condition and and our, our wicked hearts, Jesus makes no defense for himself. Jesus has orchestrated every part of his ministry up till now, and at this point, he lets the human heart take over with murderous intent and does nothing to avoid it. So the final point of application is Jesus's death was voluntary. He chose this for you and me. He chose death on a cross shame and condemnation, beating and humiliation that was due for us. He took it on himself because he is just that good. He is just that glorious. And because he ultimately loves and desires those same very people that would seek to kill him. Isaiah 53, later in verse 10, verse 12, to conclude our message says this, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. I've made the point that it was the human heart that wanted its will be done. And that says that in our final verse today in verse 25, but he delivered Jesus over to their will, the people's will. Well, ultimately, as the human will is done, it's the Father's will that's ultimately done. It says in verse uh, 10 of Isaiah 53, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see to, it, uh, see to it and be satisfied by his knowledge of the righteous one. My servant will justify many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty of the strong because he poured out himself unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. So man's will seems to have been done. It seems as if man has gotten his way, but ultimately it's the Father who's gotten his way. The Lord was pleased to crush him, to give him anguish, to give him the sins of many, pour him out, pour his son out to death, number him with the transgressors, transgressors so that he could intercede for those same people who condemned him. Praise be to God that we follow a, a Savior like this that would undergo mistreatment and shame and painful death and do so voluntarily, not to please us, but to please his Father's will. Praise God that we follow such a Savior. Let's pray and we'll sing our final song. Lord, we're not worthy of anything you've done for us, God. And I hope in this message, if we take anything away from this, God, it's that you are not subverted, you are not tricked. You accepted exactly 
what the Father had for you, God, and you used our free will to achieve it. We wanted you dead because we're sinful, because we reject you, because we, we in our sinful nature, hate God. We hate goodness. We do not desire righteousness. We don't seek it. But God, you are good. You've accomplished your salvation for us, God. You've taken the sin and the shame and you bore it for us, the transgressors. God, thank you so much for being such a God that would do this thing for us. God, I pray that all of us who have accepted and believed this would be encouraged by it, Lord, and for those who have not believed, that they would accept it, accept the free gift of salvation that you have offered through your blood on the cross. Amen. All right, we've got one final song here.